Okay, I thought I was done with part six on the kingship thing, but I'm really not. I left out one of the most important components of how to apply the doctrine. Um, so that's what this audio covers. What, what I had covered, if I remember correctly, I have to go back and listen. Um, first thing is you have to regard yourself as if you were king already in order to properly train for it and learn the doctrine the way that God wants you to. And of course that means that you have to be in God's system and keep on remembering to be in God's system, ask Him to remind you. Meaning 1 John 1 9, being under your right teacher and of course being alert in case God wants to change your teacher on you. Um, learning and living on Bible under that teacher for whatever that teacher teaches that day or you know if it's online teacher then what lesson should you select uh, the third thing of course is uh, living and learning that Bible that day the fourth thing is talking to God all the time because you're gonna have to have a constant two-way interface the Holy Spirit your mentor training of a king mentor was the name of the guy who trained Telemachus and I believe Telemachus was the son of Odysseus um, Fifth, and this is optional and it varies per person, how much believer interaction should you actually have? Because it's not always helpful. Okay. So that was number number one thing. Number uh, two thing, which I sort of made number one, is that you have to consider yourself a public person. In other words, everything you do think and say, what if it were front page news? Because it is. Okay. It is to God. All right, so you have to always have that sort of consciousness. I'm a public person. What should I think now? What should I say now? What should I do now? Because God's hearing everything. That's 2 Corinthians 10.5 in operation. Okay, you're practicing it that way by considering yourself a public person. And, you know, that's really intimidating at first, but hey, this is your future. you got to train for it now. Um, I don't remember if it was second. Yeah, it was second. It was next after public person. You have to have a policy, therefore, for everything. A king can't just do whatever he feels like doing. Everything has to be based on walls and rules, even what you eat for breakfast. Now, because a king can decide what policy is, you can have a policy of no policy. But as time goes on, whatever policies you set, there are going to be flaws in those policies and you're going to need to change them. The things where you refuse to, to create a policy, you're going to find problems with that and you're going to start having policies. Or you have policies that are too micromanaging and you're going to cut back or delete policies, okay? But you have to think in terms of being a public, you know, being in the system, I just covered that first, being a public person, that's next, having policies. Do you have a policy or not? What kind of policy do you have? How detailed a policy should it be? That's that's lawmaking, actually. That's rulemaking. It's essential for kingship. Okay, and God will put you through the paces in your life to foster that kind of thinking. It doesn't matter if David was even a shepherd. He had to have policies for that. So it's perfect training to become a king to be a shepherd so you know maybe you're a stock boy right now maybe you're unemployed maybe you're doing what the world considers a menial job doesn't matter that's your kingdom make policies about it be professional and at your home life too but again you know there's such a thing as micromanaging so you know you where do you back off and that's even more important if you're you know husband wife father mother over kids and you already know something about that more than I do actually because I've never been married never had kids so you know those are issues policies so it was system public person policy and then the next thing and this is a kind of offshoot of policy treat everything in your periphery everything in your life as if it were a subject a person personify all the things you own what if those were persons and all the people you know what if they were your subjects 
And then the sort of flip side of that with people is, if you're talking to another believer, you're talking to a fellow king in training. He's going undergoing the same training program you are, individualized for him. How do you act? And in a way, you, you get a certain freedom and even a requirement of freedom. In other words, king to king, when two kings are talking together, it's just as true in the ancient world as it should be today. They have certain common experience which allows them, on the one hand, a certain greater respect and distance, and on the other hand, a certain greater intimacy and frankness. Would, as one king to another, you do not want, unless he's your enemy, and even if he is, you do not want your fellow king to make mistakes. Because you know what it's like to be king over a polity and the responsibilities of it and the heartbreak of it. So you don't want that other king, even if you don't like him, to suffer the same kind of heartbreak. So what kings do with each other is they often give each other advice. Okay, and they do it quietly. You see, you know, that's where you get those those verses in the Bible that say, you know, if you see your brother doing something wrong, let him know. Sometimes you are to do it publicly, sometimes you're not. It depends on the situation. Okay? Um, and then, of course, the other application of that, treating your fellow believer as a king, you know, when a king comes into your territory and invades it, you have to reprimand him. You, you know, I mean, in the old days when they came in your territory, they came with an army, and you had to fight them off, and you just, you, there's no compunction there. You do not have compunction. You do not feel bad about it. You should not have any guilt. They invaded you. Sorry, no can do. If you kill them, well, too bad. They shouldn't have invaded. This deters others from invading. There is a lesser application of that same idea when it comes to, for example, somebody coming on your YouTube video and they make an incredibly stupid remark that if you let it go will mislead those reading the baby Christians who read, if you don't say something, they'll think that what the guy said is valid. Because you don't say something. So on their behalf, you have to censure him. And how often you censure? Well, you know, Titus 3.10, twice and then walk on. Or maybe longer, it depends. And how severe must you be? And never be severe or, or criticized without substance. If you're going to tell somebody they did something wrong, make sure they know why. Telling somebody that they're no good or bad or wrong with no nothing behind it is is really a disservice to the person. If you tell me I'm wrong, I'm grateful to hear it, but tell me why, because I can't profit from the criticism otherwise. And it applies vice versa, too. Okay? So th that's the idea, is that what if everybody's your subject? And of course, if it's a fellow believer, he's not your subject, or might be, but he's also a potential king in training just like you. So you have a certain amount of frankness that is available, but you have to be judicious how to use it, because God's hearing everything you think. It's a training program. Okay? And as you can see, this is far harder than all the... The, the baby Christian claptrap about good deeds and giving to the poor. The world's benefit depends on your training. It doesn't depend on what you do directly for them. If you need the world to get something, you go to dad and say, Dad, hi, you know, feed the poor. You want the poor fed? You ask for it. You're a king. The king gets to order it. Meanwhile, you got to spend your time training and thinking under your king so hi, you're a king and you're a servant at the same time and your king is ordering you to learn this thinking not to run around feeding the poor. So do you need the poor fed? Fine, ask him. Then go back to what you were doing. That leads to, of course, item number four, talking to God all the time in the system. That also leads to item number four. You know, we did system, public person, policy, how do you regard everything and everyone in your life as if they were a potential subject or a king? Because that tells you how to you know, relate to people. Which brings then the next thing. Hi, all this stuff is about learning Christ. So you understand better what it is about Him. 
which of course feeds back to all the prior. And then the next item was communication. Okay, so it's public person. I mean, no, it's it's system, public person, policy making about everything. An offshoot of policy making. How you regard everybody and everything around you. With that, you know, potential king hook hook in there. How you treat them. Okay, everything. Number five, everything learning about Christ. Number six, everything about communication. Okay. And then I guess this ends up being number seven. Its basis is that your training program, being in the training program, being in the system, trying to learn your job, your future job, as if it were already yours. That benefits the world. And not doing it curses the world. Because you're a king, every little thing you do, think, and say is on divine television. Okay? And God's watching it. So just for that reason alone, you're going to want to do this. But it ends up bringing up a seventh thing that I forgot to talk about. Even though it's in all the previous six. How do you think about yourself? Now, obviously, you're doing all those thinking in the first six, and there's so much interrelating. You're thinking toward God. You're a lot of those first six sound kind of like servant roles, and they are. That's what a king is: is chief slave. But one of the persons who is in your kingdom is you. How do you think about yourself? And of course, the simple answer to it, as illustrated in these last 12 minutes, you have to think of yourself as a king. That's it. I'm at, and, you know, I was busy doing something else. And that's what prompted this audio, is I thought, you know what, I can't afford to think of myself the way I think of me. You know, you, every, everybody has his own view of himself. It's private, and it's usually, especially if you're learning anything about God, it ends up being very secondary. You end up criticizing yourself in your head all the time. You know, um, the younger you are in your head, the more you're trying to beef up your ego. The older you are, the more mature you are, the less you matter to yourself. Um, the more immature you are, the more you're your own universe. So this whole kingship thing is going to buttress your ego and make you get all, what do you want to call it, snotty. Like the Corinthians were in 1 Corinthians 4, 8 that God just brought to my mind. Um, but the more mature you become, the more you realize, you know, I can't afford to think of myself as an individual. I'm a public person. I got all these authorities and responsibilities and training I'm going through. And that's true. But you also have to recognize, you know what, you're a human being. All those first six are going to make you run ragged and criticize yourself and be tired. Okay? You can't do that. You know, you're not going to be able to fulfill your office if you do that. You have to take rests. You have to recognize, yeah, you're a human being. The most important thing is God's working all this thing together. It is just a training program. You don't have to learn everything at once. It is okay if you screw up and you are going to screw up every day. You shouldn't beat yourself up when you screw up because this is an impossible situation. That's the whole point of the trial. Satan's root contention is that God designed truth be free. That that's the wrong way to design truth. And when we get in part 7, you're going to see that in much more detail. Satan's saying, look, 
you know, you made it impossible and totally painful for yourself. Okay, fine, you want to be a masochist. Truth Be Free imposes on you a lifestyle you actually want. Okay, fine, your God, that's your prerogative. But why are you giving it to us? We didn't ask for this. Okay, it's wrong to impose it on creation. It's not good. Truth Be Shaved is better. And of course, the whole of human history is Satan's attempt to show that he's got a better idea that makes man happier okay and man actually thinks he's happier than if he went through this plan but he isn't happier and sooner or later in every human's life they get bitter and all they've got to go on is a kind of bitter, well, I was a good person, I did all this thing for everybody else, and I'm not getting anything for it. See what, you know, a Messiah I am. I am the, you know, I, I what do you want to call it, the unrequited lover kind of concept. That's how people die. You know, you basically got two kinds of people in life. They work real hard and achieve a whole lot, and then realize that it was pointless or a whole lot more people watching the ones that are busy achieving stuff say you know what that's too much work I think I'll just try to get by and that's that's 99 percent of people they're in the second category just trying to get by they'll say anything to go along to get something that they want they are sort of like just tuned out of the system they go along to a certain extent they have small interests they are small minded they're dull minded and rightly think that you know what there's no point in being anything else just get what you can while you can and don't work too hard for it if possible and then of course they make mistakes they find one or two things that they really care about in life and then they crusade on them and then they're in the same boat as the first group yeah you crusade all your life oh yeah it's noble oh yeah you make a lot of money or you don't Oh, yeah, you do a lot of good or you don't. But at the end, you know what? It doesn't matter. Conqueror Worm wins. That's what they got to live for. Which is to say nothing. Okay, but you really got something to live for. You really are a king in training. And it is going to last forever. Okay, but for all that... The whole purpose of this thing is to be with God in it. Satan didn't get that lesson. What Satan gets is that this is an impossible thing to do and all it's got is this big letdown, constant frustration. So he inserts his shave, you know, truth be shaved plan to make the little human happy, which of course never works. Christ went all the way to the cross, and what did that demonstrate? Hi, even if I'm in hell, I'm with Father, I'm happy, okay. I got to do something for Dad that cost me everything, and I really enjoy that. Well, that's a pretty big statement. And it was impossible to do. That's his testimony. It really isn't about paying for sin. It's about having an outlet to show his love for Father. Because the togetherness and the enjoyment of it is so great. Okay, but in order for that to even get to that level, he had to train real hard for 33 years. Being a king. And it was impossible the whole time. So since it's impossible, and since it has this, what should be a letdown, but isn't. Because you're together with Father in it. You're together with them in it. Yes, you're a king in training. Yes, this is work, 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 work. But you're a human being and you got to take your own weakness into account. Otherwise, the work you're doing is just going to fall apart. But for all that, it's not even about any of that. 
as I said in the fifth point, it's about learning Christ. What it was like for him to train down here. It's about fellowship. It's about learning what it's like. Why did God pick this system? Why did God design truth be free? Why didn't he do the truth be shaved thing that Satan thinks he ought to do? Why is it a happier answer? Besides being the only juridically valid one. Because, you know, if it's not truth be free, then it's truth be lie. Why is it happier? Because it sure don't feel good. It can't feel good to God to rule us. I mean, the Bible says we're booty. Okay, well, honey, we're not booty because of any good qualities in us. Why are we booty? Why do you want us? And as you learn this kingship thing, it's just one frustration after the next. And all, most of your frustrations are, why can't I do this job better? That's Romans 7, Paul complaining about his own inefficiency. His own desire to rebel. So the job itself, the training itself, is hard on you. It's impossible. You shouldn't want this. Why are you going through it? And you know what the answer is. I need you, Dad. I need you, my Lord. I want to see what it's like for you to be you. If it's bad, it's bad. But this is how you choose to live. Right, wrong, or indifferent. For better and for worse. So number seven. Is the fellowship. Thinking about... Hi, I'm an actual person. I'm going through this. I have a relationship to you. Taking time, as it were, to smell the roses. Appreciating the impossible situation you're in. Appreciating why God did this. Seeing through his eyes. Being together. And you can be in the middle of work and have this at the same time. That's what it gets to as you train and train and train and train and train and become proficient. It's just like practicing piano. First time that you're learning the keys, it's all very awkward and feels funny and it, you just wish you could stop practicing. Then you do it a second time and it's a little easier. Third time, fifth time, thirtieth time. And now you're starting to actually enjoy scales. na 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 And then you learn your first piece, and it's back to square one again. It's not so much fun to practice. You do second time, third time, fourth time, seventh time, and now you're starting to enjoy it. It's the same thing here. The promise is that the kingship is enjoyable. I I I know they do. I know they enjoy it. I'm I'm still think I'm still saying to Dad all the time, "How can you like this?" But I know he does. And I need him. I'm not. It's not about being a good girl. It long since stopped being about that. I need to see it the way he does. I need him. I just okay, Dad. What's this look like from your point of view? Why do you like this? So number seven is how do you view yourself? You view yourself as seeing them. You view yourself as a human being. You view yourself recognizing that you're in an impossible situation. And no, you don't get it right all the time. But you keep trying. You view yourself as, oh, the whole reason why this kingship thing exists. And so I can be with my king. Yeah. C7 is perfection to perfect the contract of oneness, relationship, flat, togetherness, flat, you and me, Christ in you, the confidence of glory. What's the glory? Don't tell me that there's a glory in God ruling us. There's nothing about us that's glorious to rule. Then how come he loves it? 
How come he doesn't want to be God without it? This is what Satan just trips him up total. It's a it's parenting. It's something else besides parenting, but I I I I can see it, but I don't know how to describe it. They love it. I know they love it. I haven't yet learned to love it like they do, okay? But that's the that's the ultimate reason for the kingship. Is the the oneness with them. It's personal. Everything about the whole kingship function that you do is impersonal. Roles, rules, laws, right, wrong. You know, and it is designed to facilitate enjoyment for everybody. That's true. But it goes through all this impersonal, you know, question, answer, fact, principle. You know, it seems so dry. But at the back and at the front, really, it's about being in them the way they're in you. And there's a kind of happiness that makes it all worthwhile, even on the crosses of life, which is Hebrews 12 too. So number seven is how do you view yourself? You're a king. Learning from the king. To be a king. So to be with the king. And on the one hand, that means you don't regard yourself as an individual, but as an entity. And on the other hand, it's entirely personal. Because it's with him, in him. The happiest kingdoms in history have been when the ruler is happily married. He and his wife have some kind of official or non-official co-rulership relationship. Not that she actually takes the reins of government, but that she is good at, how do you want to call it? She's good at giving her king rest and recreation and a way to vent. And when he needs advice that he can't ask of his advisors, she knows how to give it well. She doesn't conspire against him. She doesn't betray him ever. All those things are a great source of comfort and security to the ruler and by the same token you know his loyalty to her the kingdom benefits from seeing that there is a happiness that accrues to the kingdom when they know that the king and queen are happy with each other all of our fairy tales are about whether or not that's true have you noticed all of our most famous fairy tales have to do with a king or queen or prince and princess finding true love and when they don't how all the kingdom hurts. Well, how much more true is that here? So, the seventh thing is recognizing that you're in this relationship with him. That there's an intimacy growing that it's just for the sake of being together, this whole thing, all the rolls and rolls and ups and downs and, as it were, behaviors and obediences, all that. It's always been only about fellowship. It's just a way to express it. This was what Satan never really learned. He got all tangled up in inferior superior. This is the lesson Christ fully learned in his own humanity. 
You know, it says in Philippians 2, 5 through 10, he essentially th- t- took off. It, 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 it's figure speech, okay? He he took he took off his godness as if they were close. Okay, cannot always the Greek word, and it causes theologians no end of trouble because they can't think their way out of paperback. Christ didn't empty himself; he divested himself of his godness rights. He didn't use them. See, when you're having love with someone else, superior or inferior, that's not an issue. It's giving. It is also taking. It's togetherness flat. And since he was going to be the Savior, and because he loves Father so much that he wants to pay so that sin can exist... See, that's what you have to understand. We couldn't exist. Creation could not exist if sin were going to be paid for. Because it's not fair for God to look at it. So you're born the first time because he went to the cross. Whether you believe or not, that's beside the point. God has to get paid for you to even breathe. Now, God wants you to be alive. He wants you to be with him. But maybe you don't. And if you do, you believe. And if you want to know him better, you learn him. And as you learn him, the, the system of learning him is this kingship thing, which is the system first. 1 John 1 9. Find your teacher, learn and live on Bible under that teacher, talk to God all the time, and occasionally as warranted with your fellow Christians. That's number one, the system. Number two, you're a public person because you're in training to become a king. The reason you want to be in training to become a king is that will give you maximum intimacy with God and a maximum amount of stuff to spend on Him. Number three, therefore you got to start making policies about everything in your life and you determine what those policies are and you change them at will. Number four, offshoot of number three, everything in your life is therefore to be regarded as a subject or if a person who is a believer, a fellow king. How do you treat them? How do you think about them? Number five, all this is telling you what Christ was training to do down here. So number six, all this is training you how to communicate. How do you communicate the Bible you're learning? What if somebody asked you a question? You don't go out and knock on doors, honey. You're a king in training, not a peasant. God will bring whoever's going to hear you to you. Okay, but are you ready? Can you explain the Bible you're learning today? You don't know it until you can explain it. So, use number four of the system and talk to God about it. And if you're supposed to use number five of the system and talk to other people about it, well, well and good. But you have to make a policy about that because you're a public person. You see how these things all tie together. And thus you're learning what Christ did. As a public person, talking all the time in the Gospels. Isn't this cute? So therefore, the payoff, number seven, you're getting closer to him. That's the payoff of all this. Seen through their eyes. Why did they do this? What's the system? And then you come to learn why they love throwing themselves down. And it is about feeling all in all. It is about oneness and maximum intimacy, just like Christ prayed on the cross and achieved on the cross. In John 17, he prayed it. And that's what Satan never learned. That's why Satan's so bitter. He was designed to learn all this. He can't be happy apart from God and neither is anybody else. So number seven, 
Think about yourself. What's happening? I'm dead serious about this. What is going on in your relationship with God? What about you? What are you learning? So I'm failing number seven. I guess so that this audio is a request that you don't fail like I am. Of course, that's what a king ought to say, huh? (laughs) Peace out.